Will democracy survive in the next couple of years? And essentially we are the same. And there are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is life illuminated. By Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. And Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan. Acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians, a Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. Welcome. I am your guest host today. I'm Paul Anderson, and I am having the privilege today to turn the tables on our <laughs> guests. Today we have uh, uh, Mary LaHammer, journalist, TPT, uh, and, and a fixture in the uh, news uh, media and coverage in the uh, uh, Twin Cities, Minnesota area. Well, Mary, yeah. welcome you. Thank you. Thank now, I'm going to get right into it. I think most people, of course, they know you from TPT and Twin Cities Television. We hope. Oh, they do. <laughs> they do. See, I conduct a lot of tours of the Capitol, and most of them say, well, yeah, that woman. That woman on uh, uh, public television. Yeah. I mean, you became the face and the voice of the restoration of the Capitol, state Capitol. How did that come about? Maybe it was my destiny. We like to joke that the folklore around me and my family is that I practically walked and talked first in the Capitol because that's where my beginnings are. My father was a reporter in the state Capitol press corps, and I went to work with him as much as I could. So I grew up in the Capitol basement, mostly in the press corps, but also occasionally on the House and Senate floor and sometimes over in the Supreme Court. So I fell in love with that building and that profession immediately, and I've been on a quest to be a political reporter there ever since. Really? I, yes, that was an ambition? My entire life, yes. So, I mean, uh, so what is your first memory of the Capitol? It's, I mean, it's very easy to fall in the love quadriga, with The quadriga, for sure. Okay. I, the, I just remember being two or even younger than two, and the first time my dad took us up. These are the golden horses awesome. on the front of the Capitol called the Quadriga, and you can take you know that narrow, windy stairway up and go up there. And I remember as a child seeing that dazzling image of the golden horses and thinking this is a magical place. At that time, you could go right up next to the you horse. You could. You could touch them then. Did you yes. carve your initials? There? I did not. I mean, no. A lot of people <laughs> they did carve. Did. No. Uh, My father's quite the disciplinarian too. Uh, he was a teacher at one uh, point. Uh, so, okay. so uh, Mary, one yeah. of the things, or many of the things that I remember most about your coverage of the, the Capitol. I mean, you were up high on the scaffolding. I mean, yeah. I worried about you because <laughs> I knew you had MS, and yeah. you you were there with the restoration artists as they doing the fine tuning. Yeah. So, what were some of the uh, unique or rememberable things you did? Absolutely. And first, I said my health is great. I'm incredibly active. I well, still, you surely are. You know, run, walk, work more than full time every day. So I'm doing great with that. Uh, and I love heights. And well, I do. love adventure. And I love a challenge. <laughs> and all of that was mixed into climbing 100, 150, almost 200 feet. I mean, it yeah. was a big drop down. It was, and we were not harnessed in or clipped in. You were just freely climbing on the interior and the exterior. We also climbed to the top of the outside of the dome as well. And what I remember every day, and my photographer deserves more credit than I do, because yes, while well, you got to see me climbing that looked so treacherous, <laughs> imagine doing that with a large television camera Ooh, on boy. your back. That's what he was doing while I was climbing. So I always make sure he gets 
huge credit for that because you wouldn't have that image without him being even more <laughs> adventurous than I am. And, and, you know, he loves skydiving. Both of us have skydived in the past. Uh, you've skydived? Yes, for, for work, for a job. <laughs> I actually got the job at TPT the day I jumped out of a plane. Really? Yes. You it's, are adventurous. It's aren't a true you? story. Do you want the story? On yes. That? Okay, it's a tangent. But so I was a, an anchor reporter in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Had applied for the job here in the Twin Cities. Desperately wanted to come back home. Being a political reporter was my dream, and I knew I had this opportunity. They had a contest for the most daring local celebrity, and because I covered crime and politics, those were my two beats. And sometimes they interchanged, and sometimes they didn't in Wisconsin. Uh, the reward was jumping with the U.S. Army Golden Knights skydive team, something I would not necessarily do in my personal life, but I knew it would make a really good story. So I jumped out of the plane, and I got the job offer back home. You are, I mean, that's one of the things <laughs> I like about you. You're always uh, searching for and looking for that uh, interesting good story. Yeah, yeah, and, that's, and the Capitol restoration was the ultimate story. Here is the most important building in Minnesota. It was a $300 million top to bottom restoration. You know, the crown He came jewel. within budget, you know. Yeah, oh, there, there's still a little money left, actually. Yeah. I've been doing follow-up stories yeah. that they've been able to upgrade some of the accessibility and add some oh. ramps out front because some of the money was left over. But here's a building I grew up in, I loved. I get the honor and privilege to work in every day, and it's finally being restored. Ten years was the proposal, all the way back to Governor Polanyi. Okay. I remember that proposal, and here it's finally coming to a fruition. So we shot for three to four years to create the ultimate mm -hmm. documentary and then chronicle it on Almanac every See, week. I know you can't say this, but I can. Uh, okay. uh, Plenty was not a big advocate for capital restoration. The whole thing seemed to come together in 2011. And that was a time of divided government, mm -hmm. uh, Democratic governor, Republican. Mm -hmm. Was this restoration truly a bipartisan effort? A bipartisan, bicameral. The Supreme Court had to get involved. It involved every part of government you could possibly imagine, the Department of Administration. And what I will always remember is it had been debated and debated mm -hmm. and discussed, and everybody knew it had to be done. But on some level, I think for the governor and for lawmakers, it seemed as if they were spending money on themselves, which yeah. they were loath to do. It's yeah. easier to spend you know, state bonding dollars back home in your district. You get credit for that. That yeah. helps you on the ballot. I don't think they thought fixing the Capitol would help them politically, but it ended up being the right thing to do. And the image I will never forget is while that was being debated, it had failed and failed and failed. And suddenly the skies opened up, remember, and the heavens uh. poured water into <laughs> the Capitol basement. It was pouring through the tunnels and suddenly the bill passed. But you were very responsible for helping that go along because Cass Gilbert designed that building as the people's house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was so grateful. I was on the commission. And you really did convey that message that this is indeed the people's house. That was the goal, and also showing people why it needed to be repaired. Mm -hmm. The first draft of the documentary, I actually sat down with my boss, and he viewed it, and he said, it's too pretty. You need to show people why it needed to be fixed in the first place. So we redid the whole documentary, and we showed how it was crumbling, how we were losing priceless art. You know, one estimate of the art in the Capitol, if you take it, what art has sold for yeah. per square inch, it's a billion dollars I, I, worth I of that. art, and we were losing it. Some of it had literally fallen off. It was crumbling. The stone was crumbling. Georgia white marble is not the best yeah. material for Minnesota winters. Potentially. You know, it was crumbling. It was leaking. We were losing precious parts of our history and our past. And we needed to show people how much the building was failing. And making that case, I think people understood. I had a woman stop me after it reopened, and she came up to me and she said, you know, I was so mad about the money being spent, and I thought, here's so much money. This is just ridiculous. And then I came and toured it, and I mm. thought, that was actually money well spent. So yeah. we got to transition now. But Minnesota... I really does owe you a debt of gratitude for what you did. Because, you know, this is what good journalists do. They, they tell a story. And you told the story of that building uh, so well. But I want to revisit. Yeah. Your dad is Gene LaHammer. Yeah. And you know I'm a big respecter of uh, Gene LaHammer. So am I. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, I mean, journalists, I mean, he's old enough to call iconic. I can't do that to you yet. Uh, but what influence did he have on you as far as how you went about the job? Everything. As, as a human being, he influenced all of his five children so much. He is the most deeply ethical, kind, thoughtful human being I've ever known to be raised 
by a person like that is an incredible gift. He came from nothing. My father grew up in abject poverty in the Great Depression. His first memory in life, while mine was standing by the Capitol Golden Horses, his first memory was at the courthouse and his farm being repossessed in the Great Depression. Oh my That's gosh, how his the life farm started. was repossessed? That's his first memory when he was two years old. The family lost the farm. He had nothing. And what he found out once he started school, he found out he was really good at something. And he discovered he had a mind that could elevate him above his circumstance. And he had great teachers that said, this kid is special. He went to the library and he read every book in the library. He started skipping grades. He started moving faster and faster. He has a photographic memory. Mm. He has this beautiful gift. And he finished school then when he was 16, and then he went to college and finished college by the time he was 18. But, but he grew yeah. up poor, but he went to college? How did he do that? His grandmother, who never spoke a word of English, she was a Norwegian immigrant, used her government subsidies to pay for him to go to college. That's how that happened for him, for, to go to Teachers College in South Dakota. And after he graduated, he taught in a one-room schoolhouse. He first taught every grade. And then... There was a war in Korea down the road, uh, and he went and did an Army intelligence study, and they found out that he could break codes, and they would use this beautiful gift of a mind he had. And so he was a code breaker and went on to be an Army intelligence officer. I mean, yeah. has anybody told your father's story? I've been trying, yes, I have. A, a year ago, he was diagnosed with cancer. He's doing great now and beat it, but that gave him finally the impetus to say yes to my bludgeoning of, will you tell your story, will you tell? He's so humble about his beginnings and his accomplishments. And it wasn't, I think, till he kind of had a brush with death that he agreed to sit down uh -huh. with his youngest child and that's chronicle you? his story. Yes, I'm his baby. Okay. Yep. And so that's on our website, TPT Originals. So and you, people yep, can look them up. They can find it. Yep. I mean, you know, truly your dad's story is uh, worth looking up because, mm -hmm. and okay, yeah. but one of the things that makes him so iconic is he hung around a long time. Yes, he did. He 36 his, years. 36 years. He has this memory. He's got this. Yep. So Mary, yep. if you want to match him, you're going to hang around for a while. I, I intend to. I'm at 21. Uh -huh. And the other thing, because my mother will be watching and she deserves equal credit my mother was an actress a director an english teacher a drama coach a speech and debate coach so i am equal parts mom and dad <laughs> okay. so i have a little bias here but you yeah. describe your dad and i said oh gosh she seemed like he would be good material to be a lawyer and a judge mm -hmm. i mean how did it come he went out in journalism he wanted to be a judge that was his really? goal in life absolutely he was going to school to to be pre-law and he wanted to go on and be a judge that was his dream job he took a part-time job at the associated press in south dakota and found out that was his dream and his mission and he could just write and he suddenly he even described he said i suddenly became a star writer Eleanor Roosevelt came to town and he got to interview her and they really? were on the front page of the school newspaper and he became editor of the school newspaper and just fell in love with writing and journalism, but still loved the law. Oh. It's one of the reasons he loved covering you and he loved covering the Supreme Court and court cases. He never lost his love of oh. the law. So, any lawyers in the family? Yes. Uh, definitely so. Why I have, not you? Uh, you, you could have uh, my it. minors in constitutional law, well, and if this journalism thing didn't work out, I was always prepared to pull the plug and go to journalism to go to law school. You're considering <laughs> uh, the law as a backup, a secondary <laughs> career <laughs> to uh, sorry, journalism. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> but anybody in the family d see the light and pursue that? Yes, I have a sister and a brother who are both lawyers. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. Uh, that's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad we did right by you. <laughs> but I mean, I, I do remember your your father with such respect and fondness. But you uh, you talked about his devotion to ethics mm -hmm. and uh, this is a tough time. Oh, it's a for very, it's uh, a tough journalists. Time. It's a I, tough mean, time. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, mean, journalists are under uh, attack mm -hmm. all the time. I mean, okay, I want to trans. I was part of the Capitol Restoration uh, mm -hmm. thing, and is that I insisted that you know the journalists uh, stay in the Capitol, but my our intent was that that area down where they have the offices mm -hmm. would be open, the court would be open, and it's. A little bit of a disappointment to me. It's locked, and why is that? It is locked for our safety. Quite really? honestly, it didn't. When the Capitol reopened, the press score was open. It oh was yeah, open I walked down the halls. We wanted the public to be able to come to us and talk to us. But due to not our determinations, but the state patrol and state capital security have deemed it too high a security risk and that there are too many credible threats 
to us that they determined and recommended that we lock the doors. If, if they weren't, you'd be pretty vulnerable, I guess. That was the ter determination, yes. And uh, no, I I miss stopping into. Yeah. Well, you can still call us anytime. I believe you have my number. Yeah, but I'm so a you can call and I'll unlock the door yeah, for you. But I'm, That's I'm how it works. You can call. Our numbers are listed or organizations yeah. out front. Yeah. And if you call someone, we will come and unlock the door for you. But this gets me to uh, a bigger issue that's mm -hmm. going on in the country and indeed mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, Salzberger, the publisher of the Times, wrote an article about the uh, press being under attack. Mm -hmm. I mean. President Trump has used a very loaded term when referring to the press as calling them enemies of the people. Mm -hmm. That's the term that the French Revolution, Hitler and Mussolini and others have used to uh, execute and kill people. And what is it like to be labeled by the leader of the free world as uh, a member of an occupation that's an enemy of the people? I work in Minnesota and I'm lucky to work in Minnesota is what I would say because I think we still have an appreciation for the press. We have among the largest capital press corps in the country. If I you didn't look know that. absolutely if you look statistically, there are many state capitals in America that are down to one reporter left. Really? Yes. You talk about how you want to come visit us. That's because there is, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 reporters down yeah. in the Minnesota yeah. State Capitol. And I think that's a reflection of the people. We lead the nation in voter turnout. We demand and expect good journalism. We have two major newspapers in the Twin Cities. We have many flourishing local newspapers across the entire state. We have one of the largest and most respect public radio stations, public TV stations. All the commercial stations right. have offices in the capital, Channel right. 4, 5, 9, 11. We have such a robust appetite and we're willing to spend our money and our time on really good journalism here. So I love still working in Minnesota. You know, I'm yeah. going to wax a little philosophical. You know, Thomas Jefferson said that the best depository for the power in a free society, democratic society, is the people. And if you don't trust mm -hmm. them with that power, you don't take the vote away from them, you educate them. Mm -hmm. Is that part of your mission? Absolutely. And I trust Minnesotans. I am born and bred of Minnesota. I, I love this place. I wanted to come. I've worked in other states and I was desperate to come back here. And again, because of those provable, undeniable statistics, I really like numbers and stats because those are hard to yeah. skew and lie about, you know, leading the nation in voter turnout, among the highest education levels, among the highest philanthropy. We just, we give, we get involved, we engage, we care. Where else would you want to be in politics or media except yeah. here? But, but trust is a two-way street. Yeah. Do politicians and leaders trust you? I hope so. You know, probably not every day. We're not perfect. They're not perfect. Democracy is difficult, but I think democracy is incredible, incredibly durable as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I like the press, and I would mm -hmm. come over and visit. Yeah. But I always approach the press with the uh, ideas that if I did something wrong, I'd see it on the front yeah. page above the fold, mm -hmm. no, no holds barred. Yep, you bet. And I've been covered mm -hmm. unfairly sometimes. Sure. You know, I was yeah. a little <laughs> skeptical about you when you first started. I hear a, that. Really? Yes, you, tell you, us you know, why. Why were you skeptical of me? I thought you were coming in the side door. I knew Gene LaHammer. Okay. I knew his reputation, uh -huh. and I said, oh, is she riding into... Uh, I didn't realize you jumped out of a plane to get the job. <laughs> uh, were you riding in on your uh, other... So, you know, uh, you earn my respect the, uh, the old-fashioned way, you yeah. just do it. But, you know... That's how my dad taught me, is there's, yeah. there's no certain, mistaking hard work. There's no uh, replacement for hard work. You but I have a work. certain disappointment or sadness with you. Because? Because once you had earned my respect and trust, I could never get you to interview me. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we worked together so closely on the Capitol Restoration, I almost couldn't interview you, right? I knew you too well then. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I mean, I had stories. But we did, we did put you on on that topic. Uh, that's right. Uh, yes. Not on the court. Though. Not on I the mean, court. Is no. there a bias in the news media about covering the courts? <sighs> I think the courts are undercovered. I completely confess and admit mm -hmm. that. And I don't think many of our bosses are particularly interested or, or understand the courts are difficult yeah. to cover. It's not easy. It's, it's not, when you read a case, it's not simple. It's time consuming. And I will say, because we generally can't have cameras in the courtroom, it's nearly impossible you for can. us to do. You can in the Supreme Court. You can, but in general, yeah. I've worked in other states. Yeah. I came from North Dakota, I came from Wisconsin, and I was in a courtroom every week okay. with my camera. With your camera. Yes, that's the difference, is it's television. I still need pictures to tell a story. Okay. Uh, 
I mean, I, I will admit that because when people would ask me to comment on an opinion, I would have to tell them, says, no, the opinion has to stand for itself. Mm -hmm. And if I comment uh, uh, away from the opinion, uh, somebody will be citing me in exactly. court yep. as to what yep. I said and not the opinion. And I love opinions. I uh, wrote my summa cum laude thesis yeah. on a court opinion. Just so you know, I love court opinions. Summa cum laude. <laughs> yes. I mean, you didn't fall <laughs> far for the tree, did you? Uh, he taught us well. What? Both of them. Both of my parents were teachers, too. They both all okay. taught us well. Yeah. But talking about just, are there some state leaders that uh, you really like working with mm. and had respect and some rapport Absolutely. with? I mean, I, I'm not talking current. I mean, you no, know. the, the big picture of it, I really think our governors are fascinating. As a political reporter in the Minnesota State Capitol, the person and the character we tend to cover most closely are governors. And Minnesotans have had such a wonderful kind of sense of humor and yeah. they've been gutsy and we have picked just characters all the way you know our our current governor the soldier educator football coach he's a fascinating character before that you know a, a wealthy heir dedicated to public service but you know divorced talks about his depression but this deep desire for public service two fascinating characters before that, Tim Pawlenty, the, you know, pulls himself up by his bootstrap story, you know, grows up blue collar South St. Paul. Dad was a truck driver. Mom dies of cancer young. Timmy gets to be the first member of his family, go to college, gets to be an attorney and then elected to local city government and then elected to the legislature and then majority leader and then governor and then almost vice president, almost president. Right. I mean, we keep these fascinating, and okay, Jesse Ventura before that, the pro wrestler, actor, talk show host turned governor. I mean, they give us great material, the now, people he, in Minnesota. He was a all reporter's dream. I don't know. Is that, I, I think dream uh, turned nightmare for a lot of people. <laughs> I loved it because I thought it was a great adventure uh, and I was young and didn't know uh, better. <laughs> but here's something I've learned about, uh, and Jesse Ventura is probably the, the most, uh, the longer governors are in office, especially towards the end of their uh -huh. term, the more they think that they want you to you know, carry their message for them. And on, they dislike on, on, us more. The longer yeah, they're around, yeah, they the more do. they dislike us and the less they want to talk to us. That's yeah, generally that true. Is, that yeah. is a normal trait. Absolutely. We're all used to that. So how yeah. do you deal with that? Uh, you keep reminding them that it's their job to talk to the people and that it's my job to get them to talk to the people. You keep pressing. You keep pushing. Okay. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, that's one of the reasons I wanted to keep the uh, portraits of the governors mm -hmm. in the Capitol. I mean, I go visit them from time to time, they're friends. Now, uh, I want to talk about something else, but you know, Daniel Chester French mm -hmm. has these iconic mm -hmm. six virtues. And there are a couple of those virtues that you and I have talked mm -hmm. about that are very important because he's wanted them in the people, he wanted them in the, the leaders, and he wanted them. And what are those two that you look to? Truth and integrity, for sure. I think that's one of the reasons I got into journalism is that pursuit of truth and also what my dad really taught us as a human and as a journalist is having integrity. Okay and so I you know mm -hmm. I know that that I can just see you walking up the steps and looking up there yeah. and uh, and seeing and, them up close that was uh, a once in a lifetime oh, opportunity. You saw them up I close? did we, we we climbed the scaffolding on the exterior when they were restoring those as well so to be just inches from them was okay. kind of awe-inspiring. So now I don't post anything on Facebook, but I follow on Facebook, <laughs> and I follow you on Facebook. And I mean, you got some major pride with a member of your family, yes. your daughter. Yes, I have one child, and it, she is a very serious, focused, high-achieving student and athlete that we're really excited well, to see about. Her I know she's, she's young, yeah. talented, but, yeah. but she is. Uh, on the national radar score, scope as far as soccer, right? She is. She's the number 10 ranked goalie in America in her class right now. Now, is yeah. that because of your coaching early in life? Oh, gosh, no. I never played soccer. The only coaching I am a little bit responsible, I coached her in basketball and played basketball mm -hmm. my whole life. I've coached her a little bit in running, so she's a four-sport athlete right now at mm -hmm. Lakeville North. Soccer, cross country, basketball, and track. And then she plays on uh, the Elite Club National League, so she travels nationally for soccer, which is her love and her passion and what she wants to do for her college education to try and get a soccer scholarship. Okay. Yeah. Well, Mary, you know me well, and yeah. I'm using your daughter as an entry point for a pretty serious question. Okay. Uh, as we speak, there are demonstrations in Canada and around the world, this young woman from Sweden, about climate change mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
I, I'll be frank, my generation uh, hasn't left the world in as good a shape as it should mm -hmm. for her generation. So, if you could tell me what her attitude is the future and what you as a parent tell her about the future, because I think there are people in the audience who would be interested mm -hmm. in uh, what you do. Okay. I think she's incredibly optimistic. As really? you might be able to tell, I'm incredibly optimistic too. I, I, that's just my character and my nature. And I think she thinks her generation is going to make it okay. You know, she does little things in her everyday life. As simple as if we buy a plastic straw, she'll say, what are you doing to the universe, Mom? Can we go get a paper straw instead? She'll say little things like that to me. She, so, so this generation thinks about that. And they don't just think about it, but they implement it. And she's thinking very much about her career. And she's looked at, OK, what are my qualities? What do I think I'm good at? What can I do? And we've talked about before, she's interested in law. And she's also interested in medicine. She's talked about doing mm -hmm. bioethics, that that might be the forefront as we're mm -hmm. able to you know, change our DNA and, and really kind of mess with nature. I, we might need some good bioethics officers someday, so, so that's something she's interested in So pursuing. if I were yeah. a parent and say, what do I do to instill that same kind of sense of optimism? That's a great question. I, I just talk about the news with her every day. Instead of, instead of shunning the news and protecting the news from her, from day one, we talk about it. I have the radio on. I have the newscast on. And we talk about it. I've never tried to shield her from reality. Instead, we talk about it. And so she understands it. Kids are going to hear things. Media is yeah. everywhere. You cannot keep them away from it, but rather educate them and discuss it with them. That's going to We're running out of time yeah. here. But media, the news media has changed a lot oh, yeah. since you started with the internet and whatever. How do you deal with that? Every person on the planet who has a smartphone is a reporter now. That's really? how it's yeah. changed. Yes, the, the politicians don't need us necessarily. They have a phone and they have Twitter. They can broadcast and talk directly to the public in a way that they didn't used to. So we are not a completely necessary part of talking to and reaching the public. So that's, well, that's, that's tough. Yeah. That's scary because sure. you used to be a filter. I mean, you yeah. could you know, mm -hmm. like or not like the filter, but you used to filter, but there, there aren't filters anymore. We say our job at Public Television and at Almanac is to provide context and depth to the news. So we don't tell you what happened. We try and tell you why it happened and how it happened. And I think there is still a role for that. Okay. So, and you try to accomplish that role with the iconic, not the truth and integrity has to inform you. That. As best we can. So we're yeah. getting to the end. Is there anything else that you want to say to the public or say to me? Uh, say to you. Well, I, I think part of your legacy and the thing that we should all talk about is where we started, too. The Capitol Restoration, yeah. the most important building in Minnesota, and how it took bipartisan, bicameral, but also every leg of government, including the court, to make it happen. That was not an easy accomplishment. Yeah. See, you know, that building actually describes democracy in the mm -hmm. government. And that's what you've done. You, by what you've done and put together, I, I can't tell you how many people come to the Capitol because, well, I saw the story of that lady on public television. I think did. the tour guides have a love-hate relationship with <laughs> me because of that. Why is that? I mean, well, I can only be a love say, relationship. Oh, I want to see what Mary did, and can you take uh, me up to that? And then Mary did this. I think they grow a little weary of hearing about uh, our show and our documentary. Yeah. So, Mary, thank you so yeah, much for being here. You. you are a delight. I mean, as I say, you're not old enough to be called iconic yet, but you're well on the way to that oh, status in Minnesota. Thank you, sir.